So good afternoon. Uh, we just had a chance, uh, Lieutenant Governor and I, to walk through this before bed facility that was set up by Mike Lau and the folks from Cape Cod Healthcare, uh, along with General Keefe and General Lau from the FO, excuse me, from the National Guard. Where is he? There he is. Um, and I just want to say, first of all, um, when I said this to General Keefe on my way in, um, we are all incredibly grateful for the work that's been done by the National Guard across the Commonwealth since the beginning of this outbreak. Uh, when you call, they come. And they have been on the scene uh, in a whole series of um, typical and many atypical scenarios and projects and missions since this all began. And uh, I can't say enough good things about uh, about the work that they've been doing. Um, the facility itself uh, looks a lot like uh, the field hospital that we toured uh, at the DCU Center and very similar to the one that I had a chance to take a look at at the BCEC. And I say that because uh, one of the things that makes this possible is the number of times that the Guard and uh, FEMA and MEMA have worked to put these kinds of facilities up, not just here in Massachusetts, but all over the country and around the world. And it makes them very good at it. And this thing went from uh, nothing uh, to what it is now, fully outfitted and ready to go, 94-bed facility in about six days. Is that about right? Yes, correct. And Mike's also a terrific leader. Um, we've talked a lot about testing. We've talked about how important that is. I do want to give you some updates on this. We think testing is a big part of um, identifying people who are dealing with COVID-19, but it's also part of then recognizing and identifying the people they've had close contact with, which is why we're working on putting up what I think will be one of the largest contact tracing programs anywhere in the country. Uh, because in the end, uh, testing and tracing are a big part of how we actually push back uh, over time against COVID-19. Um, we continue to make a lot of progress on testing, you know, depending upon whose data you look at. We're either the third or fourth largest tester in the country, which is quite an accomplishment since we're certainly not the third or fourth largest state in the country. Um, and we continue to make progress. As of yesterday, we've conducted about 122,000 tests, including 5,319 tests that were conducted yesterday alone. Uh, and we're now conducting testing at 28 sites statewide. And we continue to get more nimble and more creative with our testing as we go, as we talk to our colleagues in the healthcare community, and as we create new and different options to ensure that we're testing in the right places. Thanks to a lot of hard work and collaboration, uh, we're now offering testing through mobile test units at nursing homes that's supported by the National Guard, at assisted living residents and Department of Developmental Services group homes, including the Rentham and Hogan sites at Gillette Stadium and at the Big E for first responders, grocery store workers, and others, and at a CVS test site in Lowell where the public can make an appointment online. That's a rapid test system there. You can do up to 1,000 a day. And through mobile test kits that are supplied directly to long-term care facilities that have the capacity to actually do the tests on site uh, so that they can do their own testing quickly. And we'll keep working to expand our testing capacity for more residents, especially in communities that have had severe outbreaks like Chelsea, where over the course of the weekend, we expanded our testing uh, by 4x. We continue to chase down PPE wherever we can. Uh, and through our COVID command center, over 3.3 million pieces of personal protective equipment have been distributed to hospitals, nursing homes, community health centers, public safety personnel, local boards of health, and state agencies. And that includes nearly 2 million gloves, over 720,000 masks, over 365,000 masks from the aircraft delivery, and over 167,000 gowns. Starting Sunday, the command center has started posting a daily inventory of PPE sorted by types and where it's been distributed around the state. This will provide a regular update on where our PPE is going, what types of supplies are in use by our first responders and frontline healthcare workers as we continue to navigate this pandemic. As everybody knows, we've also been modeling where and when we think the Commonwealth should expect to see a surge in cases, which has helped us put together our projections on how many beds we expect to need and where they need to be located. 
Secretary Sutters and our COVID command center have been working closely with the hospital community, some cases every day, throughout Massachusetts to understand the capacity and at the same time also what's going on day to day there. And they're now posting a daily dashboard to update the public on hospital capacity around the state. This will be posted starting today at about 4 p.m. It will include an estimated inventory of how many beds, hospital beds are available and where, including ICU, acute, and field hospital beds. For hospital capacity as of Sunday night, we're up to about 15,900 usable beds statewide. Roughly 5,000 of those beds are available for non ICU or acute care. Roughly 2,000 of those beds are available for ICU care, and nearly 1,000 beds are available in our field hospitals for patients who need it. In short, we have about half of our beds available statewide right now for different levels of care. As part of our strategy to increase bed capacity in all corners of the Commonwealth, we've been pursuing the construction of five field medical hospitals in different regions. The beds in these facilities will serve as an alternative care option for medical professionals to treat patients, especially those who need less intensive care. Each field hospital has a local health care partner, and that's why we're here today with Mike Lemon and the folks from Cape Cod Healthcare, because they are the partner and sort of the lead dog on this site. Cape Cod Hospital um, has been a terrific player and a terrific partner in this, and Mike will have uh, an opportunity to speak in more detail about the work they've done in a minute. The Lieutenant Governor and I have toured the hospital at the DCU Center in Worcester, which opened its doors to patients last week. I took a walk through the BCEC last week, and they started accepting patients last Friday. We're also on track to open two additional field hospitals, one in the Merrimack Valley and one on the South Coast. In Lowell, we're in the process of opening up a field hospital at the UMass Lowell Recreation Center in partnership with Lowell General Hospital next Monday. That facility will have 95 beds. And on the South Coast, we're finishing work this week on a 140-bed field hospital at UMass Dartmouth. This site here at Joint Base Cape Cod, as I said earlier, will house 94 beds and we'll start taking patients on Monday. The site would not have been possible without the terrific work of the National Guard, Cape Cod Healthcare, MEMA, and the folks in our command center. MEMA procured and coordinated the non-medical build-out of the facility and passed the baton to Falmouth to add medical equipment, supplies, and personnel. The command center's medical surge planning team will provide ongoing support to the hospital, and this site really does rec represent a terrific partnership between the National Guard uh, and the team to utilize Joint Base Cape Cod. I do want to take a minute to speak a bit about all the National Guard is doing to support our COVID response efforts throughout the Commonwealth. I think many of you know that last week I signed an executive order that increased the number of National Guard personnel who can be activated from 2,000 to 5,000. At this point, we have about 1,500 Guards people that are on active state duty. The order I signed on Friday will allow a more rapid call-up if needed and will allow sick or injured personnel to rotate out without a reduction in force and give the Guard more flexibility with respect to their missions. They have been a crucial component and a big player in our COVID-19 response. General Keefe and his team have been planning for countless missions, some you'd expect and many you wouldn't, but all of them have been done with the excellence and efficiency that the Mass National Guard is known for. Some of the stuff they've been involved in includes erecting screening tents at DOC facilities to protect against introduction of the virus to our state um, correctional institutions, helping support the building out of our field hospitals, assisting public safety officials in cities and towns, transporting and di distributing PPE to hospitals, first responders, and partner agencies, conducting daily missions to partner to perform COVID-19 testing at long-term care facilities, which they've done all, over 3,000 tests at more than 250 locations in the past two weeks, working with the Holyoke Soldiers Home, where the National Guard medical and operational teams are working hand-in-hand -hand with on-site staff to provide meals, medical care, and assistance with daily living to the resident veterans, and a host of other initiatives. And I just can't say how much we appreciate the work the Guard has done. They've stepped up every single time we've asked, uh, and they've been especially terrific this time. Uh, putting this 
field hospital together at Joint Base Cape Cod is a great step forward for all of us in increasing our capacity in this part of the Commonwealth. And we'll continue to do all we can to make sure that every community in Massachusetts has the resources they need to push back against the virus, especially during this surge period. Now, we know everyone's anxious to talk about how we get back to something like normal, and I can promise you that I am too, and I know the LG and everybody else is as well. And especially on days like this, when I get out to sites like this one, where I know I would normally be shaking hands, maybe giving a few people a hug, a couple of high fives, but obviously there's none of that going on because everyone is doing the things they need to do to stay distant and to stop the spread. But our data is showing that we have some very difficult days and weeks ahead, and that's precisely why we're here today and planning for what we call the worst case scenario. We certainly hope we don't have to use these beds, or certainly not all of them, but we wanted to have a plan to make sure that we could if we needed to. We've also started to talk with folks about reopening, but we would think at this point in time that we have a lot of work to do uh, before we would put a plan like that into motion. But that is why, in many respects, we launched our first in the nation contact tracing initiative. That's why we're making more and more testing available, because we think at the end of the day, testing, tracing, isolation, quarantine, those are big parts of any legitimate effort and play a major role associated with any attempt to reopen because those are the sorts of things that we will need to do and do well and do on a grand scale to give people confidence and comfort uh, that we are safe uh, to get back to work. Part of the planning also requires listening to and learning from our neighboring states. We share a lot of commerce, a lot of travel, and a lot of people with the states that are around us. What we do has an impact on them, what they do has an impact on us, and we want to make sure everybody's aware of what everybody else is thinking about, working on, and planning. And that's why we'll be working with our regional partners going forward. But I do want to make a couple of things clear about this. First, our response to this emergency will always put the needs of the people of Massachusetts first. We're going to work collaboratively and we'll learn from all the experts we can but we're going to do in the end what's right for Massachusetts and for the people of Massachusetts. Second, reversing course too soon, opening up before we're ready and before we've done some of the things we need to do that we can do it safely and have a plan in place to make sure that we can monitor, measure, and survey what's going on will only make matters worse. Everyone's had to put up with an extraordinary amount of grief and in many cases, a tremendous amount of loss over the course of the past six weeks. Taking our foot off the pedal with respect to what we need to do to push back right now on this virus would squander, in many cases, a lot of the progress that we've made. Our hospitals, who we're talking to every day, are managing the influx in new patients. Nobody is rationing anything, but we're still on the upswing in this pandemic. Everybody's done a great job. I can't tell you how proud I am and how grateful I am to be a part of this wonderful community here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, where everybody has a part to play, they understand it, and they sign up, and they follow through, and they execute on it, no matter how big or how small it might be. And everybody, as we've said before, needs to continue to stay at home, only leave if you need to do something essential, and if you do leave home, and you can't manage to create distance between yourself and others. If you're concerned about that at all, you should wear some kind of a face covering. If you're going to the grocery store, or the pharmacy, or to the doctor's office, or someplace like that, because that's how you protect yourself from others, and it's also how you protect others from you. We know that in many cases, there'll be some tough days ahead for our residents, but the way we get through this is by playing by the rules, sticking together, following the advice of our public health officials and others, and recognizing and appreciating that we have a lot of really smart and talented people in the healthcare world here in Massachusetts who can help us get through it as well. And with that, I want to turn the mic over to one of those people, Mike Lau, the CEO of Cape Cod Healthcare. Thank you, Governor Baker. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Polito. I'd also like to re recognize Secretary Sutters and your teams. Uh, there is no question that with Governor Baker's leadership, he has saved countless lives in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. 
his definitive response to this pandemic, his foresight to make sure that we have the capacity that is necessary and needed for the residents of this Commonwealth is noticed by those of us in the healthcare community. And we all, we all owe you a debt of gratitude. We were asked to set up this field hospital uh, to ensure that the needs of the people of Cape Cod are being met, as well as those from neighboring communities if the need is there. Uh, I too would like to thank the National Guard, uh, General Keefe, General Foe, your incredible support to stand this facility up in six days, MEMA, the professionals that came in to create what is for all intents and purposes a hospital that used to be a gym just six days ago. As noted, we have 90, 94 beds. Uh, each bed uh, is equipped with uh, a mattress and a bed uh, to be able to, to house uh, the patients comfortably. Uh, we have portable uh, x-ray equipment. We have pharmace pharmaceuticals here, lab work here. We have our inpatient electronic medical record. Uh, we'll be able to take care of patients that are not quite as ill as you would generally see in a acute care setting, but still not well enough to go home will be able to manage their care here. Each person that comes here will not be directly admitted. They will first go through a hospital. That patient will be triaged appropriately, treated appropriately, and when appropriate, sent to here. The coordination that we will have, not only within our health system, with also the neighboring hospitals that may send patients here, uh, will, be, will be true to form. Uh, we will make sure that we understand the patient's needs. We will make sure that our physicians, our nurses, our aides, our techs, our pharmacists, our PTs, are all here to ensure that the best possible care can be delivered. We have no timetable as to when this facility will be taken down, but we do know that we'll be able to treat patients as of this weekend. It's important for us to remember, as the governor noted, that we have to keep this pandemic in the front of all of our minds to ensure that we're doing everything possible to keep our residents safe. I lastly would like to thank the incredible team that I'm fortunate to work with every day at Cape Cod Healthcare. 5,700 employees with co one common mission to take incredible care of people. I couldn't be more proud to be here on the Cape and be with these dedicated frontline workers that care more about their patients than they do themselves. Our ability to respond to this pandemic isn't anything different than we've witnessed with all the other healthcare providers across Massachusetts, and I'm proud to be in this profession. Once again, I'd like to thank the governor and lieutenant governor. Their leadership is unparalleled. The response to this pandemic has been second to none, and we are, prayer, we are prepared because of their dedication to this commonwealth. Thank you very much. Questions for any of us? Delivery of medical supplies. What can you tell us? Well, if they get here, I'll tell you about them when they get here. But as we've said many times before, we don't talk about this stuff till we actually see it. Maybe. What are they exactly Gear. What kind of gear? I'm not going to talk about it till it gets here. We've said many times that we don't count gear until it shows up. Mask. They're also touching a surface that uh, the CEO here was just touching. Is that, a, is that the right uh, thing to be showing? We've given guidance to people, and I'm glad to see that many of them ad have adopted it, where we've said if you can't create distance, uh, we urge that you wear a face covering or a mask. As we did our tour of that facility, I wore a face mask. Uh, when I'm out touring or visiting places, just going for a walk, uh, in my hometown of Swampscott, I wear a mask. Uh, I want to make sure that people actually hear what I have to say, especially when we do these briefings, because a lot of the messaging is designed to get to the people in Massachusetts, and I want to make sure they're going to hear me, and that's very hard to do if I'm wearing a mask. Governor, I have a question about this advisory council with the states coming together. The initial news release had six states listed. You spoke to us yesterday. Clearly, this was percolating. Did you consider not joining, or what was the delay in not being part of the initial announcement? We had a lot going on yesterday, and um, and one of the things we also had going on yesterday was uh, we talk um, remotely. We used to have a leadership meeting every Monday with uh, the Senate President and the Senate Ways and Means Chair and the Speaker of the House and the House Ways and Means Chair and the, and the Senate and House uh, Republican Minority Leaders. Um, we're not having that meeting physically anymore, but we still do the we still do a phone call, 
every Monday at two o'clock. We do another one usually on Thursday afternoon as well. Um, and it's sacrosanct. I mean, it's on the calendar. You can't change it. You got to be there. And uh, and now more than ever, we want to make sure that we don't miss those opportunities to talk because we don't have the same type of down the hall opportunity to engage when we're not in those on those phone calls. Um, and I think the press conference was actually at two o'clock. And um, we just simply wanted to get stuff we needed to get done in Massachusetts today, uh, yesterday, and uh, and we're we're talking to some of those folks over the course of uh, over the course of the day, and um, and made our announcement last night. It wasn't had nothing to do with the with anything other than the fact we just had other stuff going on. When the president has compared. Hold on one second, let me just follow up. Does this give you any pause, though? And you say you want to put Massachusetts first, and yet we got this regional approach with this giant state, New York, and Governor Cuomo on TV every night. Do you feel like, in any way, you're hesitant? So, many of those states are significant commerce, trading, and travel partners with us. And, um, and the most important thing I think we all need to do when we think about reopening the economy is to do it safely and to do it in a way that ensures confidence in the public that it will be done in a way that doesn't create a rebound, an echo, whatever kind of phrase you want to use with respect to what we've just all been through uh, for the previous few months. The second thing I would say is we are in a different place uh, in terms of our surge than some of other, those other states are. But I do think it's important for us to collaborate and cooperate where it makes sense to on a go-forward basis so that we know what they're doing and they know what we're doing and neither one of us, none of us, does something unintentionally that disadvantages or damages the others. and. Um, and I think it's really important that everybody understand um, that this is, you know, we're in the midst of something. Why we're here today is because we're in the midst of what we believe is going to be a very difficult period for our healthcare community and for our Commonwealth over the course of the next several weeks. And we wanted to make sure we had the capacity uh, to provide care and services and support to people during that period. We all recognize and understand that at some point, um, people would like us to try to come up with some strategies, and we've talked before about the importance of testing and tracing and isolation um, to make it possible um, for us to start thinking about how people can get back to some of what I would describe as, as sort of the typical routines of life. But those typical routines of life need to be planned, and they need to be organized, and they need to be done in a way where we can keep track in a very granular level of what's going on and ensuring that we keep people safe. And I think from my point of view, uh, to not involve any kind of conversation with a bunch of other states where things happen every day there that in a traditional functioning world um, affect us and things we do here affect them um, would be a mistake. Final authority on reopening, and he compared the governors who are in fact forming these coalitions uh, to a mutiny. Uh, so, are look, you part of a mutiny? If you've, if you've learned nothing else about the Baker Polito administration over the last five years, it's that we're a lot more interested in the work than we are in the noise. Um, I think for Massachusetts to forge ahead here without presuming that we're going to have conversations with states that are around us about what they're up to and what we're up to so that we make sure nobody does anything that creates harm unwittingly for somebody else it would just be a bad idea. And I think in some ways, um, some of our largest trading partners, some of the, I mean, think about all the people every day who cross between um, Massachusetts and Connecticut, Rhode Island and Massachusetts, New Hampshire and Massachusetts, Vermont and Massachusetts. I talked to Phil Scott, the governor of Vermont, and Chris Sununu all the time. And I talked to Janet Mills, who's the governor of Maine, quite a bit as well. Um, I think it's going to be really important that we all pay attention to what the others are up to and make sure that nobody does anything that puts somebody in a really bad spot um, because they just weren't thinking about what that impact was going to be on some other part of the northeast part of the U.S. Governor, do you have a 
problems where you need from the federal government at this point? Do we have enough ventilators? Um, we're still working on ventilators. Um, Depends upon how you think about it, but we put in an ask for a thousand. We've gotten 400. We've also managed to secure some others uh, through the private market, but we're still working that one. Do you worry that the president is playing politics with the uh, distribution of ventilators and other equipment? We've had a very good working relationship with FEMA on this stuff, and um, and I continue to believe that FEMA is bringing. Um, the resources that they have available to these tasks and to these activities. Um, we're going to continue to advocate aggressively for Massachusetts uh, because that's our job. And, uh, and we are going to do everything we can to make sure we have the gear that our hospitals need to protect and, and, and serve people. If we're short by 60 percent on ventilators, is there a plan B for requiring them if the federal government isn't providing them? We're chasing a variety of options in the private market, yep. Governor, uh, you mentioned testing in your remarks. Uh, the SJC got a report out today on testing in uh, at, uh, prisons and jails, and they uh, said there's little testing taking place in the you know, jails and prisons. Are you satisfied with the efforts going on in the prisons and in the jails to address testing and making sure everybody's safe and not spreading? So I haven't read what you're talking about, but I can tell you that there's a standard protocol for testing in, we well, said the jails. Do you mean the jails or the prisons? I know a lot more about the prisons than I know about the jails. Um, uh, we follow DPH protocols on this stuff, and we've done a great deal of testing and continue to do testing um, in, uh, in the prisons. And, uh, and, and we have a deep relationship with WellPath, who's our, uh, our health care provider there. And, um, and many of the same uh, decisions that we made with respect to the way we thought about um, other 24-7 institutions, whether they were on the mental health or the public health side, we implemented exactly the same policies in the prisons. Should all the inmates and all the staff be tested? Would that be a safe thing to do? Is it, is it well, I don't know if I call it. The, the issue here is you want to test where you think you have opportunities uh, to solve problems. And generally speaking, that's not only been our strategy in the prisons, it's been the strategy we've used in other parts of the Commonwealth as well, which is why we're one of only, I think, two states in the country that are involved in uh, aggressive mobile testing programs in nursing homes. Governor, the Boston everybody. police just tweeted that an active duty officer tragically has died of COVID-19 just happened. Would you like to reflect it all on just the sacrifice that our first responders are going through during this crisis? You know, the um, I say all the time, especially about folks in, in law enforcement, um, that uh, they open doors every day where they have no idea what's going to be on the other side. Um, they walk up to a car on, a, um, on the side of a road and have no idea what's going to happen then. Um, the complexity for them associated with uh, the presence of a virus like COVID-19 just amps up in a significant way almost everything associated with the work that they do. And, um, and as I've said many times, whether you're talking about people who are driving buses or uh, rapid transit cars or trains uh, or working in our hospitals or driving ambulances or uh, serving food or picking food. There are people all over the Commonwealth and across the country who are doing what we think of and define as essential services. Um, DCF social workers who are out there keeping in touch with and staying on top of some of the most at-risk kids and families in Massachusetts. Um, and they do it because it's their job, but they also do it because they chose this to be the way they define purpose for themselves. And, um, you know, I get asked a lot by people, well, what's going on? Are a lot of people not coming to work? How's what's going on? The simple truth is the vast majority of the people who work in state government are showing up every single day. And many of them uh, do very difficult things. And, um, and, and I've said before that I think in times like this, the public sector matters more than it does in many cases because we end up doing a lot of the work. The folks who work for us, the folks who work at the municipal level, they end up doing a lot of the work uh, that needs to be done uh, when we get into a situation like this. And in this particular case, um, obviously, uh, my heart, and I think everybody's heart, goes out to him and, and to his family, and especially to his brothers and sisters in uniform. When is the Patriots 
Like I said, we don't count gear until we get it. Thanks.